Hello, grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to another lecture. We have lesson two here, processes of memory part two. I know that's a big shocker, part two. Uh, let's get right into it. The first is a little recap. And what I wanna tell you is if you write this down or in some form, uh, leave another space underneath. Because at the end, we're going to uh, do another little recap. We're gonna have long-term memory added as well. So just leave some space. You'll only have to write this whole thing once. If you leave some space underneath this, somewhere, wherever you choose to write this uh, for the long-term memory. But the recap here, uh, we have three processes of memory and we talked about two of them already. Sensory memory is the first one. And the duration of the sensory memory is just for a fraction of a second, enough time um, for your senses and your brain to process something, but really no longer than that. Um, your capacity for your senses is huge. You can take in a lot of different things uh, and feel them, um, touch them, hear them, uh, see them. Your sensory memory is very big. And an example would be hearing the teacher, but not really listening. It's into your senses just for a fraction of a second. Uh, Short-term memory, it would be uh, roughly 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds. 30 seconds, I think, would be pushing it. Um, you can keep about seven items in your short-term memory, and that's why we rehearse a phone number until we actually dial it uh, so that we don't lose it. Okay. So long-term memory, we're already on to key point two. Long-term memory is our relatively permanent and limitless storehouse of the memory system. So long-term memory is essentially permanent, and as far as we can tell, it's limitless. There's no like amount of information that you need to start erasing things that you knew before you can put them in. It doesn't work like a computer. It is huge, it's as big as you can imagine. It stores memory without the conscious effort, although you can improve how much you remember with some effort. Um, it's stored according to categories or features, and your brain reconstructs what needs to be recalled when you need it. Uh, there's a lot that we don't understand about memory, to be honest. It's a very impressive thing, how you can take all the senses, uh, put it into your brain, and then remember it. Uh, and then spit it out your mouth when you need it. But uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about some things that help memory and um, some different types. So I'm sure there's more than three different formats, but long-term memories can be stored in three different formats that we're gonna talk about today. Um, the first type is episodic memory. So this is a memory that um, you remember because of an event. Maybe it's a traumatic event, or maybe it's a very exciting event. Uh, I kind of have this um, short memory of being at the first game um, uh, in the MTS Center for the Moose, which was like, I don't know, 2004, 2003, something like that. I just have this uh, memory of this short episode of being there. Um, during a car accident that I was in, I have this vivid memory um, uh, uh, during it. So like these are episodes, events stored as uh, a sequence. And often there's something large about the events. It's not small events during the day. Like I went to the store, I went to Shoppers Drug Mart. Things like that aren't generally stored in episodic memory. Uh, semantic memory is the memory of general knowledge uh, stored as facts, meaning, or categories. So, uh, like I said, if you're uh, connecting it, it to something that you are interested in, or if you're learning something specifically to use it, uh, this is semantic memory, just general memory. Um, and then procedural memory is the memory of skill. So maybe if you play volleyball, you have this uh, procedural memory of how to uh, form your body to make a pass, a set, and a, a hit. Uh, we store these skills as a sequence uh, so we can perform them in a sequence. Um, so as we gain the skill, uh, we gradually lose the ability to describe what we're doing, uh, which is why like some people that are experts at things, they cannot tell you how to do something or teach you how to do it. Um, if 
you to be able to say it out loud um, procedural memory kind of like overrides that okay uh, memory in the brain so now we're already on to key point three uh, not much is really known see I want I think I made I hope I made this clear in, in unit two uh, about the brain as well is that we know a lot about the brain but there's even more that we don't know and there's a lot that I don't know uh, each piece does a lot of different jobs um, I can say that it's involved in something but it might be involved in like 50 other things as well uh, so just take what you see here uh, with a grain of salt um, and um, we'll, we'll do our best to make sense of it. So we don't really know a lot about what memory looks like in the brain, but it appears to uh, activate a specific pattern of neurons. So when you remember something, these specific neurons fire. So when you are creating a memory, you must be uh, making this pattern or uh, setting out this road network for this memory. The more often certain neurons connect, the stronger the connection is, and that leads to easier transmission of a memory. So if you make more connections to these neurons uh, by learning more, you're gonna have easier transmission uh, of what you need to know, essentially easier recall and recognition. So we have this diagram of the brain, and again, take everything that you see here with a grain of salt, and I'm not asking you to remember all of the words on here, uh, but the thalamus, among other things, is involved in our sensory information, um, or sensory memory. So that's in the midbrain. Um, it is um, involved in the sensory memory part of it. It helps us make sense of all the stuff that we're seeing. Um, the cortex and uh, the cortex, which is the squishy main part of your brain, that is involved in long-term memory and short-term memory. Um, it's all the working part of your brain, all of the knowledge, all of so your skills get stored in here. Um, but your hippocampus, which is also in the midbrain, is also involved in your long-term memory. So I'm not saying that like the cortex is only long-term memory or that the thalamus is only information processing and sensory memory, but um, these are some of the key structures in your brain. The thalamus, uh, for sensory memory and the cortex for long and short-term memory along with the hippocampus for long-term memory. So here we have overall the system of memory. Um, we have an input, which is the senses, the stimulus, and we put that into our sensory memory. Any information that we don't pay attention to in our senses is lost. Uh, it is gone. If it doesn't reappear in our senses again, we will not be able to remember it. But everything that we pay attention to goes into your short-term memory. Um, we do many different things to remember information. Uh, maintenance rehearsal is one, but there are a, m a bunch of different strategies, but any information that we don't specifically commit to long-term memory using a strategy or because of a type of memory that we talked about um, that makes us remember it, maybe connected to an emotion, uh, that information is lost and all the information that we do want to remember, hopefully all the information in this course gets encoded into your long-term memory. Now, long-term memory can be degraded a little bit over time, but hopefully we'll be able to retrieve it and put it back into our short-term memory so that we can say it, speak it, use it. Uh, so that is how memory works. Senses remember it. What we pay attention to goes to short-term memory, and what we encode goes to long-term memory for us to use later. Here is the chart. Ooh, it's a little cut off, but that's okay. Here is the chart that I was telling you about to leave a space at the bottom, so I hope you left one space at the bottom. We have long-term memory over here uh, for the stage. The duration of your long-term memory can be up to a lifetime, so I hope to remember things that happened to me when I was a kid and a teenager when I'm old, uh, but maybe not. Uh, the capacity for your long-term memory, as far as you can tell, is monstrous. We have no idea uh, exactly how big because we don't need to delete specific things like you do on a computer to get them into new things into your long-term memory. Uh, and an example would be remembering your sweet birthday party from about five years ago. 
uh, or even longer in my case if you went to the uh, corn maze and then chicken delight that was pretty cool uh, so there's important terms for you to check out and then there is a graphic organizer that I would like you to do about the structures of memory something like this but obviously way better and more detailed because we talked about many different types of short-term memory uh, sensory memory we talked about a lot long-term memory we talked about many different things so you can use this as the basis for example but I want you to take it above and beyond uh, this particular diagram uh, but thanks so much for watching everyone. Uh, I will see you in class uh, uh, Goodbye